Oh, we are recording. Oh, okay. Got it. Good tip. That okay. one? Around, yeah, yeah, yeah. The walking around one is better. So, so Uh, today was a pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Maxton Lee. Her first name is Bernice. Uh, Bernice uh, got a bachelor degree in Chinese study from the University of Leeds, United Kingdom. And then she got a PhD degree in political science from the uh, City University of Hong Kong. Uh, her expertise on political economy of global sustainable development and sustainability transition. Uh, she has uh, a lot of experience working on the sustainable development goals. And today her talk will be on, you know this very short title, on the definitions, what is definitions? I see that Bernice has a longer title now. <laughs> How words make eco uh, ecological challenges harder to solve. So that's welcome, Bernice. Can everybody hear me? Yes, you can hear me now, right? Okay, perfect. Dada <laughs> hao. That's about the limit of, of my Chinese, so bear with me. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here, and thank you for giving me such a nice welcome. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk today about uh, how words make ecological challenges harder to solve. Um, I'm going to talk about what I mean about that in a second, but first of all, I want to ask you a quick question. What do you think of um, when you see these pictures here. What's the word that comes into your mind? Just call it, call it out. Breakfast, fantastic, okay. So, <laughs> how about this one? Okay. Okay, so it's also breakfast. All right, so this is a typical breakfast in, in Paris, and this is a typical breakfast that we would go out for in Taipei. So if anybody remembers uh, Mr. Lin in Zhongshan Guoxiao, this is a homage to Mr. Lin. Um, so this is a typical breakfast in, in Taipei. So a sandwich, uh, maybe a, a delicious cup of coffee, or maybe a, a bowl of hot or cold soy milk with, uh, with some dough sticks. And then this is more like what a Parisian would think of when he wakes up in the morning and he wants to go for breakfast. He thinks of maybe uh, a smaller cup of coffee, um, some bread maybe, uh, a croissant, uh, a pan au chocolat. Same kind of concept, a little bit different. Same word though. Okay, now this one. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> if you talk to a Scotsman or uh, somebody in England about what they feel like for breakfast in the morning, they're going to think about something that looks much more like this. So even though this massive plate of what is it, eggs and bacon and sausages and black pudding, and I feel exhausted just thinking about it. There's so much food there. This looks very, very different from what we would think of here when we first wake up in the morning and what a Parisian would think of when she wakes up in the morning. But these are three words, uh, three different concepts, all described as breakfast, okay? So, hang on. So 
They're the images and the ideas that we have in our heads. Helps us to, it, it, it shapes the way that we imagine what we're going to do and how we're going to go about fulfilling our ideas and our expectations. So understandings of the concept are actually different, even though the words are the same. Okay, let's try another one. What do you think of when you see this? Just call it out. Yeah, vacation, okay, right? So vacation or leisure. So this is a typical thing for some people, the typ typical vision of what a holiday looks like, lying in a hammock under a palm tree, lying on a beach, uh, maybe catching some sun, maybe having a cocktail in the evening, a lot of sleeping. But for other people, this is the last thing they think about when they think about a leisure or a vacation. Those people might think more along these lines. So they might think about something really action-packed, maybe cycling in Hua Lien, uh, maybe doing a, a swimming challenge, maybe running up mountains, something really action-packed, kind of Iron Man challenge. Again, it's two uh, different concepts, but they're both described by the same word, by vacation or leisure. Other people might think of this as more their idea of leisure. So a working holiday in Australia, they would like to go and pick grapes or uh, serve drinks. And then in their spare time, when they've earned some money, then they're going to use that money to go traveling. So these are three completely different concepts, but all described by the same word. So although, so the ideas that you have in your head and the, uh, the, the, the images that you have in your head when I say the word breakfast, when I say the word leisure, they shape how you go about trying to bring that idea about, trying to make that idea happen. And they, just, they depend on your own personal perspective. So they depend on your experience, your personal preferences. They're very individual, right? So understandings of the same word depend on interpretation. How do you define breakfast? And how do you define a holiday? So although a lot of people think that they understand each other because they're using the same words, actually the ideas, the concepts that they have in their heads might be different. And so they're actually having different conversations, even though they think they're talking about the same thing. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about how meanings and ideas of words can lead to challenges in dealing with big environmental problems. Now, the difficulty of meanings... Okay, so let's, get back, let's go back a step. So, the dictionary defines breakfast as the food that is eaten at the first meal of the day. And leisure is defined as the time free from the demands of work and duty. But we've already established that the way that we think about things can be much more diverse than the way that the dictionary uh, describes them. So the difficulty of meanings makes it much harder to deal with big problems like climate change. Because if we can't agree on what words mean, then we can't agree on what to do, on how to move forward. And if we disagree on the basic definitions, even though we're using the same words, we'll pull in different directions. And when it comes to big, complex problems uh, like climate change, we need to decide on what we're going to do. We need to have an agreement about what we're going to do. And that's very difficult. And it's difficult for a lot of different reasons. Right? Okay, so it's difficult because of uh, cultural differences. Um, it's difficult uh, because of differences in experience or maybe different levels of economic development. It's also difficult because of the need to translate into several different languages because this is a global problem. But it's difficult for another reason as well. And that's a reason that is not particularly well understood. It's not a reason that is... Um, 
particularly acknowledged, and it's not something that has been very well researched. And that is that even within the same language, people understand what words mean in very different ways. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because if I'm having a conversation with you about sustainability, and you're talking to me, and my understanding of the word sustainable is different from your understanding, then we're actually having two different conversations, even though we're using the same word. And if then we involve everybody in this room, and everybody has a different idea of what sustainable means, then that's a lot of different conversations. Okay? So that's what today's topic is all about. So I'm going to talk specifically about two words here, about forest and about sustainability. I'm going to talk about what are forests and what is sustainability. Now, I could have chosen other words as well. I mean, I, I could have chosen other words that, that will also describe this problem. Economic growth um, or economic progress or um, the purpose of economy. Um, freedom, which is a word that probably everybody in this room has uh, a fairly solid idea of. And you probably think that other people feel the same way more or less feel the same way about that term. But if we're having a conversation about freedom and our ideas about what that actually means are different, then it's going to be very difficult for us to agree and to find a positive outcome. So I'm going to talk to you about these two words, forest and sustainability, and then I'm going to uh, pull it together and talk about why that matters uh, for climate change and why that's important. Um, and then I will wrap up with a few concluding ideas. Now, a couple of quick words on theoretical framework. Who's groaning inside? Most people, when I say theoretical framework, they go, oh, no. <laughs> OK, I'm not going to go into this in, in great detail, because we don't have enough time to, to really go deeply into it. But it's important in my research. Um, and this is a theoretical framework that really kind of um, uh, underpins what I do. And I draw a lot of my ideas from this guy here, Antonio Gramsci. He's a political philosopher, a uh, political and social philosopher um, at the uh, beginning of the 20th century. Has anybody heard of Gramsci? Cool. Okay, and, and he um, really talked about why societies don't change even when they need to. And this is something that I found very useful for looking at, at climate change uh, and sustainability um, because we have a major challenge that we're facing and our human society globally is not changing even though it needs to and even though we are receiving a lot of information which tells us how serious it is. There are lots of discussions about how we need to change but somehow we're not doing it and I find that Gramsci is really helpful for thinking through that. Now, one of his big ideas, his most influential ideas, was common sense, which, in a nutshell, is basically a way of thinking and behaving that is widespread in society and which is not questioned. And there are lots of ideas and values that we have that we don't really think about. They, they influence the way that we behave and the way that we think, um, but we don't really challenge them. And sometimes we need to in order to change. So what does common sense look like? These are some examples of the kind of common sense ideas that a lot of people have that they don't really question. So I'll go through them very quickly. For example, developing countries are unsustainable, so they're the ones that should change, not us, not developed countries. If companies can't make profits, society won't be efficient. Too much bad news will make us depressed and unable to address climate change. I hear this a lot. Governments are basically inefficient and tyrannical. They're just waiting to be dictators. Companies and the market are the ones that should regulate life. The market will always find the best and most efficient solution. Consumers want the bad stuff. 
So companies have to sell it. We can't help it. You guys want cheap t-shirts. It's not our fault. Firms are at the mercy of consumers. Economic growth, resource extraction, corporate and personal profit are vital for civilization. We can't do without them. And if change isn't incentivized by profit, then it won't happen. These are just some of the common sense ideas that get repeated in the media, uh, in the stuff that we read, um, in uh, conversations with each other, in teaching materials, in, uh, in, in education, and we don't often think to challenge them. Okay. So moving on. What are forests and what is sustainability? Forests. What is a forest? That sounds like a ridiculous question. I mean, this woman must be kind of crazy. Did she just ask what a forest is? <laughs> but I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to tell me what a forest is. Can somebody put their hands up and tell me what a forest is? Or just shout it out. Yeah, go ahead. Lots of trees. Interesting concept. <laughs> okay, anybody else? There are no wrong answers here. Trust me on this. Anybody else? You don't trust me. You think this is good? This is going to be a trick, isn't it? This, this is a, a, a tricksy question. Okay. All right. So let's 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 try another way. Who thinks who thinks that this is a forest? Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. Not many people think this is a forest. Okay. Good. Who thinks who thinks that this is a forest? Uh -huh, yeah, okay, right. So, so you're all right, actually, it turns out. So let me just describe what this, this, this is natural growth, ancient growth rainforest, right? What many of us typically think of as forest. This one is an industrial plantation, right? This is palm oil trees. We're going to come back to this picture in a second. So I said there were no wrong answers. I meant it, or did I? I also didn't mean it. Okay, so... <laughs> So it turns out, let's start with this picture up here. So this is that industrial growth forest that we just talked about. So the Indonesian, former Indonesian Ministry of Forestry says that this is a forest. Now, this is a bigger picture of the same thing. This is, a, um, these are cash crop trees that have been planted on what used to be natural growth forest. These trees were cut down and they were burned and the land was cleared so that these industrial trees could be grown. The Indonesian, ex-Indonesian Ministry of Forestry says that this is a forest. The IPCC, the UN's International uh, uh, Panel on Climate Change, say that industrial plantations do not count as forests. So we have already two completely opposing concepts of what a forest is. Interesting, okay. What about this one? Does anybody think be brave. Does anybody think this is a forest? <laughs> Don't be stupid, that's a, that's a building. <laughs> but actually, it turns out. So I went to this building uh, a couple of years ago. This is in Jakarta. This is where the Indonesian Ministry of Environment and Forestry have their offices. And it turned out that officially, I was on forest land. Yeah. So officially, it's very hard to believe, officially, according to the uh, Indonesian Ministry of Environment and Forestry, this building is classed as forest, right along with that, right over there. According to their official classification, there is no difference. Okay, interesting. So, classification number three. So, we're... You know, nobody's going to dare put their hands up here if I say, is this a forest? Who thinks this looks like a forest? I do. I think it looks like a forest. Yeah, you think it does. Yeah, good, good. Well done for being brave. <laughs> okay, well, so my colleague at Eteha found when he was looking at exactly this piece of land here that the coffee farmers in Western Ghat in India who were looking at the same piece of land said, that is not a forest. I said, yeah, it really is a forest. <laughs> But the, re the, re the reason that they said no, they insisted it's not a forest, is because if you call it a forest, that means the government, the state, can take it from you. That means that the farmers who are working there, who are living there, 
who built their lives there, they have all their rights taken away to live there and work there, and it belongs to the state. So he found that just by using that word, he had a big fight on his hands. So he, he, got, he upset a lot of people. There was uh, confusion and anger and conflict just from using that word. So they said, this is not a forest, this is our land, because that's what they call it. Okay. So, forest is not so easy to define after all. So how words are defined depends on the stakeholders. It depends on who is doing the talking. So a, um, a farmer, a small-scale farmer uh, in the forest, um, sorry, not forest, <laughs> a small-scale farmer uh, who is um, working is, is going to have a different concept of what a forest is um, and what land change looks like and what he's going to do uh, with the landscape um, than a construction worker or a construction boss. Now, a construction boss might look at a forest and he would see the potential for development. He would say he sees that he needs to go and buy um, permits to clear the land and build a shopping mall or a housing complex or an office block. So they both have different concepts about what, what the use is of a forest and how to define it. Um, a conservationist from Norway or Switzerland might see the forest as living space for orangutans, or they might see it as a carbon sink, so a vital part of the, the fight against climate change. Um, a national politician might see more potential in that as uh, a place for industrial development or a place for uh, improving economic growth for the benefit of the whole country. Or he might see the potential of the forest as something to help the country to establish national borders, to show neighboring countries this is our land by using the land for something productive. So all these different stakeholders have different ways of defining and using uh, forest. Now we can't say that they're wrong because they're all entitled to their opinion and they're all logical. These are all logical ideas. But it does influence the way that forest and deforestation are defined and that then has an impact on the measures that are taken to protect forest or to uh, conserve it. And this causes confusion then about targets and makes it very difficult to say how much deforestation has been happening already, where it's been taking place, and what to do about it. So it makes it hard to stop deforestation. So if this industrial plantation is counted as forest, even though it's required deforestation, it's required trees to be burnt down and cut down and completely removed in order for those trees to be planted, then how are we going to define exactly deforestation? And the Indonesians say that if you plant trees on the land, then it's no longer deforest deforested. As long as you plant something on there, it's not been deforested. Okay, so all indications show that tropical deforestation is getting worse. So there have been fires in Brazil uh, and Indonesia and deforestation in the Congo Basin adding to the CO2 problem. Since the 1970s, nearly 800,000 square kilometers of what was originally 4 million uh, square kilometers of Brazil's Amazon rainforest has been lost to logging or road construction, dams, mining, or other forms of development. That is approximately the size of Turkey. Um, it's bigger than the state of Texas. Um, Indonesia's forest loss has been rising with some dips in some years and some spikes in other years um, since the 1970s. Um, this is a graph that's taken from my book, which is coming out next month. Buy it, buy it. You can't afford it, it's too expensive. <laughs> um, so forest loss in Indonesia has also uh, been rising um, over time, over the last several uh, decades. 
Um, the Congo Basin, which is the second largest rainforest in the world after Brazil in the Amazon, um, lost around 165,000 uh, square kilometers of forest um, between 2000 and 2014. That's an area of land which is roughly the size of Bangladesh. Um, the amount of forest that was lost to new road construction, um, so forest lost to new road construction has, has quadrupled since uh, 2000. Now despite that, many stakeholders, including national politicians, uh, development experts, um, conservationists even, say that conservation measures have been a success, which is interesting. Um, so they say that uh, measuring tree loss alone is too narrow a distinction, it's too narrow a way of measuring conservation success. And they point instead to things like um, improved transparency, um, improved governance. Um, they point to better inclusion of stakeholders in uh, discussions and negotiations. And so they say that actually conservation has been successful. So if we can't agree on what deforestation means, then again, how can we stop it? Okay, so much for forests. Let's talk about an easy one, right? Let's talk about sustainability. So what does sustainability mean? Well, the dictionary says, that which is capable of being sustained. Okay, so no mention of nature so far. <laughs> Good, all right. And then it goes on to say, in ecology, the extent to which the Earth's resources may be exploited without seriously damaging effect. Okay, that's maybe a little bit more helpful. But much better known than the dictionary definition of sustainability is this one from the Brundtland Report, um, which you will all remember is, uh, the, the full name was the 1987 Report of the World Commission on Environment and Development, our common future, very catchy name, easy to remember. And the report said that sustainability or sustainable development was development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. All right, fine. So much for the official definitions. Can anybody tell me what they think sustainability is? Just examples of sustainability. Sustainable behavior. Anybody? Community engagement. So, yeah, so they try to engage the sustainable concept in this. Great answer, perfect. Okay, so ecotourism, very good example. Any other examples? Yeah. Okay, so sustainable fishing, right? Like sort of MSC. Um, there are some labels which uh, which try to tell us that we're we're fishing sustainably. That we, the fish that we're buying has been caught sustainably. Great example. Okay. Any others? Yep. Yep, so closed loop development, yep, exactly, very good. Or circular economy as well, that's another one that's, that's used. Any other ideas? Okay, great concepts, very good. Okay, so here are some other examples of what people typically think of when they think of sustainable behavior. So we've got recycling, uh, using uh, windmills or um, solar energy uh, instead of burning fossil fuels for energy. Um, electric vehicles instead of uh, using the fossil fuel driven cars. Okay, so let me just talk you through this. So um, over here we have uh, recycling bins in Vienna. And people in Vienna will take their bottles, their glass bottles, their plastic bottles, um, their, 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 their glass um, jars, their metal, their paper, down to these bins, they're all over the place, they're in every community, and they put them in these bins knowing that they're going to be recycled because they think that that's sustainable. And I know that we also have a very good recycling um, system here in Taipei. And 
then we have uh, electric vehicles. Okay, so when I first came to Taipei, which was um, less than two years ago, I almost never saw any Teslas in the street. And at first, you know, people, when I talked to people, they didn't really know what a Tesla was. Now that's changed, right? Okay, in a very short space of time. A lot of Teslas in the street now, along with other uh, electric vehicles, hybrids. Um, so people drive electric cars if they're Teslas because they're cool, uh, but also because, because they want to be sustainable, right? And people are encouraged to um, put solar panels on their houses. Uh, in some countries, they get, they get grants to do that. Um, Vienna, in, in Austria, they're, they're putting a lot of investment, and I know this, this is true also in Taiwan, into building um, wind farms and um, sustain, uh, renewable uh, energy plants to replace fossil fuel power stations. Unfortunately, none of these is as sustainable as we would like. Bless you. Um, so recycling plastic bottles doesn't stop hundreds of millions of plastic bottles from being produced every day. And millions of tons ending up in landfill, in the oceans, where it then breaks down into microplastics, which then ends up in birds, in fish, in animals, in the water system. And electric vehicles also. Um, require massive amounts of scarce resources um, to be extracted and processed and manufactured and transported uh, until uh, bef way before they can get to the point of us driving them uh, and producing no emissions at the tailpipe. And if the country that you're driving the car in still generates electricity from uh, burning fossil fuels, then when you charge the car, you're still producing emissions. Um, in Hong Kong, the popularity of the Tesla has caused an increase in the carbon footprint because most of their energy is still generated from burning coal. Unfortunately, um, the same is also true of uh, solar panels and wind farms because they also require scarce resources to be uh, mined and extracted and then transported and then processed, manufactured, transported again before they get to the point of producing emissions-free energy. And then at the end of life, there's a problem when you scrap all these things, then there's how to handle the waste. And batteries from electric vehicles um, cause a particular problem. All right, so then what is sustainable? Well, although many people and companies and governments and NGOs and students and teachers talk about sustainability, very few people actually have a very clear idea about what it means, about what sustainability is. And there's no common concept, there's no common agreement on what ecological sustainability really is. And there's been actually very little research that's been done to try and define what a sustainable uh, human society would look like, what a sustainable economy would look like. And so that makes it very difficult then for us to achieve it. In spite of all these conversations, these discussions that we have about being sustainable, where it's very difficult for us to be sustainable if we don't know where we're going. So when we do start to think in terms of what would be ecologically sustainable, we start to get into very strange territory because it's so far from where we are now as to be almost unimaginable. It would require a huge change in the way we organize our economies and conduct our political and social and economic lives. It would also require a very big change in the way we view progress and the way we view success. So ideas about sustainability, ecological sustainability, are still very underdeveloped, but that we, we, we can identify some uh, characteristics um, about what it should look like. 
So I'm going to read through this list, and then I'm going to talk you through in detail about what this means. Okay? So a sustainable economic system should be long-term, able to endure for many centuries, should exist within the bounds of nature, should have a maximum human ecological footprint. The rights of future generations and other species should be protected. Progress should be measured differently from today. There should be planned leisure time to offset efficiency increases. And there should be limits to personal and corporate freedom. Now, many of these are very difficult concepts, and they become very political uh, as you start to get deeper into them. But I'm going to talk you through uh, those ideas. So to be sustainable, a system must be capable of lasting for several generations, maybe thousands of years, because that's what the word sustainable means. Right? It needs to exist within the bounds of nature. It needs to respect the bounds of nature. So that means that you can't pollute the atmosphere. You can't poison the water. You can't use more resources than can be regrown. Because that would make it more difficult for future generations to exist and to thrive. And so that means it's unsustainable. It means that there has to be a maximum ecological footprint because the Earth is finite, right? So there are um, physical limits to how much we can use up and how much we can pollute. To survive long-term and to live within the bounds of nature, the rights of future generations need to be measured equally to the rights of those living today. That's actually, that's a very weird concept when you start to think about it. That's quite difficult. That means that the rights of people not yet born need to be equal to the rights of people living today. Now that has a profound impact, a profound influence on how we think about how much we can consume and how much we can pollute today. Because nature is interconnected, other species also need to have an equal right to prosper. So if we destroy the bees, all bees, for example, well, then that's going to have a devastating effect on our food production. So we need to be very careful not to upset the balance of nature without fully understanding the consequences. Progress needs to be measured differently from today. Now today, in our current system, um, progress is usually measured in terms of uh, increasing GDP, so economic growth. And it's measured in terms of um, uh, increasing uh, human material welfare, so how much stuff and money we have, basically. Right? Um, but none of these is compatible with a sustainable system, because that usually means it increases, increases in resource use, and that's not sustainable. So we need to change the way that we measure uh, success and that we measure progress. But it's, it's important still to have a dynamic society. We can't just shut down uh, innovation. And I think some of the lessons from the, um, the old Soviet uh, communist system taught us a lot about this. So we have to still have a dynamic society. So uh, improvements in efficiency need to be encouraged. We need to uh, be encouraged to um, continue to be innovative, to continue to make improvements um, so that the things we do and the products that are made get better and better. But the problem is that usually under the current system, when efficiency increases, that means that production increases as well. And that means then that resource use increases, and that is what we can't do. So, in this concept, one way to get around that is to say that any increases in efficiency are rewarded with time off. So that means that if you increase your output, good for you. You get to spend more time with your family or... Uh, doing healthy outdoors activities or reading books. So anything that's not work, as long as it doesn't use up too many resources. Sounds good, right? Yeah, cool. 
Okay. Um, and the other thing that we need to, 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 to concentrate on, and this gets, this gets very, um, people get very upset about this one, <laughs> um, is that there need to be limits to what individuals and companies can do because they need to be restricted. People and companies need to be restricted on, um, uh, uh, on how they use nature or the effects that they have on nature. So they can't do anything that is going to damage nature in a way that will make it difficult for future generations to thrive and to make progress. This all sounds, this all sounds like some sort of communist nightmare, all right? But it's not really. It's, it's, it's more an, an acknowledgement that humans live in a finite world and that our activity... <laughs> Human activity needs to exist, needs to take place um, within the physical limits of the planet. Now, that's not a difficult concept, actually. I can't close that one because of the... Slide, the, the, the light. Um, so I'll repeat that. So the concept is that simply we live on a finite planet. There are a lot of us. And so human activity needs to take place in, in ways that uh, respect the bounds of nature, that respect the physical limits of the planet. That is not rocket science. All right, that's actually quite an easy concept when we think about it for a few seconds. But it's so far away from how we're living at the moment that actually it's very, very difficult uh, to, to, to make that happen. Okay. So how does this affect our response to climate change? Well, very simply, if we can't agree on the definitions, then it's going to be very difficult for us to agree on any solutions. So we have to figure out what we're talking about here. Deforestation uh, is a major source of carbon emissions. It also is uh, very important for regulating local climate, uh, for providing a habitat for non-human species, um, as well as a home, livelihood, and a sense of identity for many societies. But how can we stop deforestation when we don't know how to define it? Sustainability is a huge issue for many people, many companies, many governments. But how can we achieve sustainability when some people mean ecological sustainability, planetary sustainability, and other people are talking about corporate or commercial sustainability? We don't even know what sustainability means. So that makes it very, very difficult for us to achieve a positive outcome. Now, ultimately, you could say that those two are actually linked, the, the corporate sustainability and the ecological sustainability. This is something that's talked about a lot in business. You know, if you, if you don't take care of the planet, then there isn't going to be a planet for you to make profits on. So, you know, it's a, <laughs> it's a lot better for you to make your company and your business fit in with the physical bounds of nature. Um, but actually, what we're currently doing is prioritizing the sustainability of profits. And that cannot be. If we continue along those lines, then it's going to be very difficult for us to be ecologically sustainable. So this is leading to problems in tackling climate change. And we can see this in climate change agreements uh, um, in, in the wider world, in the international community. Because without being clear on how to define problems, solutions become very badly focused. So we have climate agreements, but they're very, very weak on targets. So they, they should, for sure, they agree that there's a big problem that we need to do something about and we all need to work together uh, to, kind, to, to try and do our best. Um, but they don't actually set hard targets for reducing carbon emissions by a certain date. So the meaning of words changes how we understand the problem. And because of that, then they determine not just the solutions, but the way that we imagine the solutions. Right? So just how our concept of breakfast 
and leisure changes how we pursue the hunger in our bellies to go and get breakfast or the need for uh, rest and rejuvenation in the way that we go and find leisure, it's the same is true with this. We define these things according to our own interests and our own experiences and our own preconceptions. And societies get stuck in this common sense way of thinking. And this explains partly why we have failed to address the climate challenge. To put it very simply, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this one. <laughs> if I say to you, let's go to Bali, <laughs> Well, my tones are very bad. Maybe I should have said, let's go to Bali. <laughs> so we could end up going to very different destinations. So you could end up going to Tamsoy River. <laughs> and you could end up going and having a really nice massage in Indonesia. Good for you. <laughs> and I would end up somewhere lost in France. <laughs> so if we're going to go on a journey, then let's try and make sure that we're all going in the same direction. <laughs> Thank you. So I also n I noticed when you show the deforestation area changes in that slide, in your title, you particularly shows the fire in Brazil, the deforestation in Gango. So I just, uh, I mean, there's a time series of the forest in here, here. So the title here, you say, with fires in Brazil and the deforestation in the Gango. So as your topic or your whole concept for today's talk is about the definition. So I'm just curious whether you are trying to talk about the two different things in Brazil and Gango. Does it matter how you define it and uh, about to discuss the impacts of the uh, deforestation here? So can, can, you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, because uh, today's talk, you are trying to talk about the definitions. Mm. So here, you say with fires in Brazil oh. and the deforestation in the Gango. Mm. You use two different terms here. Yeah. Is that purpose or just yeah, not okay. purpose? Great, great question. Okay, thank you. So fire, this is a very important issue. So fire is in uh, forest, in natural, uh, in, in, in rainforest, a very common way of deforesting. Um, so in all of these countries, uh, when when people want to clear the forest very quickly, they cut down the trees, they cut down the old growth, very big trees, which they want to sell for logs. And then whatever's left that they can't sell and get money for, they burn it, because that's a very quick and efficient way of clearing the land. So fire is, if you like, a proxy for deforestation. So that's why I use the term fire uh, and deforestation side by side. So where there are fires in uh, Indonesia, for example, they're often blamed on uh, smallholder farmers, on small farmers. And they get out of control in a dry year and then you know, a million hectares of forest is gone within a few weeks. Now, what often happens is that uh, it can be smallholders that set the fires, but they may be being paid by the big companies who want to plant palm oil and they don't have a permit to clear that land. Okay, so it's classified as um, you know, primary forest, as, as old growth forest, and so they're not allowed to get a permit to clear that land. But if it accidentally catches fire, then it becomes, it, its classification changes. So then it becomes either secondary forest or destroyed forest, and then they can get the permit to do what they want with the land. So deforestation is often done by fire. So, yeah. mm. Basically, you use two different terms and try to interpret the same thing. It's the same thing. 
basically it's the same thing okay. which which just goes to show the different terms <laughs> become very confusing i'm yes. speaking i i've got a concept in my head of what i'm talking about but you don't have the same concept because you're thinking well fires and and deforestation where's the link here okay. so this is a perfect example of why we need to make sure that we're on the same page i see because in the beginning i thought you want to um mention that that their deforestation uh, behaviors are different in Amazon and in Gango. But it seems like you are trying to talk about the same thing, right? There are, there are differences at several levels. Um, so uh, in Congo, there may be more shifting populations uh, as people become urbanized or people move from one piece of land to another. Um, in uh, Brazil, they're more, there may be more um, introduction of cattle farming or soy uh, farming um, than there is in other countries. But the basic dynamics are still the same. And actually, this, th these similarities have increased um, in recent years as well. Um, as more and more big companies and big interests get involved in trying to, um, trying to acquire land uh, around the world um, and trying to grow cash crops. It's usually, it's, it's very often cash crops rather than food crops, which is interesting. Um, there are a lot of companies, there are a lot of investors um, who never go anywhere near uh, the rainforest um, who are involved in deforestation. So investors in uh, Singapore, hedge fund uh, investors in um, New York or Frankfurt, will invest in commodities like palm oil because they're going to get a good return on that. And so then uh, palm oil infrastructure receives a huge hit of funding. And so they start developing palm oil infrastructure in uh, Indonesia because they've got all this funding from investors in New York and Frankfurt. So deforestation often is happening not because there is some small-scale farmer who wants to increase his plot of land because he, he's, he's making money for himself, but actually because of investors thousands, tens of thousands of miles away uh, who simply want to make speculative profits. Yeah, um, according to the definition of sustainable um, sustainability, you talk about like uh, mm, you present different type of forest, for example, the one in Indonesia. So, I mean, my question is about like, uh, because susten sustainable, sustainability, um, um, we pose, I mean, we might on three main concepts, like social, environmental, and economic. So, um, do you think like any type of forest maybe can be sustainable? For example, the one you show in Indonesia. That's a very good question. So, I would argue that there's not, there's not much that is sustainable about a huge industrial scale plantation. Um, that doesn't mean that a smaller farmer should not invest in palm oil uh, or in soy or in cattle farming. The biggest problem as far as I've seen, is where very large companies start to do monoculture on a huge scale. That is not sustainable. But then again, it comes to what do we mean by sustainable? I had a meeting with a, uh, the boss of a palm oil group in Indonesia. And he told me that his palm oil plantations were of course sustainable and that in fact not just sustainable they were good for nature they were he even argued that they were better for nature than the natural growth forest um, he told me that palm oil fruit was good for orangutans because it's good for their fur because it gives them essential oils that they might not otherwise get now that, to me, was clearly not 
compatible with my understanding of ecological sustainability. But I think in his head, it was compatible with his notion of the corporate, um, the corporate definition of, of what sustainable farming would look like or what sustainable crops would look like. So we can talk about what I think will be sustainable, but actually that's not going to get us any further down the line. What we need is to define what sustainability looks like, and then we can start to understand how much can we deforest? How much palm oil can we plant? How much cattle farming can we do in order to stay within the physical bounds of nature? And as long as it, it falls within the physical bounds of nature and it's not depriving anybody else of the chance to uh, make progress and to thrive, then yes, it's, it's sustainable. It's for, it's for the people back home. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to uh, ask about uh, some uh, technology. Uh -huh. uh, technology is all around us every day and uh, uh, all the history. And in your opinion, you, uh, do you think technology help us toward sustainable development or not? Or the answer is uh, no. Uh, how do you think uh, to adjust the trend? Thank you. That's a great question. I'm very glad you asked me that. Um, technology, of course, um, can be part of the solution, for sure. There are some amazing technological innovations. We in Taipei have, or in, 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 Southeast, in, in Asia, actually, have seen the benefits of technology in the last few weeks um, when many of us have not been able to fly. We've not been able to go uh, to meetings in different countries. I was supposed to be going to Vienna next week to teach a course. Because of the virus, I'm now not able to go. <laughs> but thanks to technology, I can still hold my course. I can do it online. So. If we think about that then in terms of, whoa, okay, so what are we going to do to address the challenge of climate change? That's a great way to stop people from flying. We can reduce people's air miles enormously um, by using a different form of technology. Um, so we have on online meetings instead of face-to-face -face ones. It's just one very small example. Technology can be part of the answer. I would argue that our problem is not one of technology. I would argue that it's not even, can I say this? It's not even one of science. The problem is a scientific problem, of course. It's about physics, it's about chemistry. It's about geology. But the reason that climate change is happening is not because of spontaneous scientific processes in the natural world. The reason that it's happening is because of social and political decisions. We have, we have as a human society caused this problem. And we are choosing as a human society not to fix it. And so I think that technology can be used in innovative ways, but first of all, we have to decide as a human society to fix this problem. And the answer cannot be driven from a desire to sell more products that are more sustainable. That's where I see a, a real problem. That um, I, have, I have a friend who works for an oil company. <laughs> He's been my friend for a long time. <laughs> He has gone to a lot of the same meetings that I have. He's seen a lot of the same information that I have. And he is now using his experience to drive the sales of uh, the production and the innovation, technological innovation of electric vehicles in that company. Now that's great. But his focus is on the sustainability of the company and the industry. His focus is on how can we survive as a company, and how can we sell things that people are going to want to buy? Now, that's a technological solution. But it's actually only a part of a technological solution because of what I described earlier on, because it's still using scarce resources. 
and it's still creating waste. So yes, the short answer is yes, but. <laughs> we can, of course, use technology in innovative ways. And maybe there are things that we need to um, invent that will help us to do that better. But the main thing that we need is not new technological innovations. The main thing we need is a social and a political response and a decision that we need to do something about this. And, and the, deci the decision that, that we're going to do that, no matter how hard it's going to be for our economies and for our societies and, and politically, Great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, because uh, even though the definition are diverse and uh, heterogeneous, but since you use, you know, him here, so I'm wondering, you, you still think that, uh, you know, there are hegemonic discourses, and uh, what are the historical power block mm -hmm. that shape mm -hmm. the even though it looks like diversified, but yeah. underlying there are similar things. For mm. example, Bali, mm. Paris, mm -hmm. Paris. Mm -hmm. Even though it's in different country, in different you know meaning, but why use that term here mm. in Taiwan? So it might be something that you want to deliver based on Gramsci's idea, but you s did not to talk about that today. But I think uh, your paper. I'm sorry, I, I do not get a chance to read your work. But since you use him, the core issue will be what are the historical power block yeah. shape the hegemonic discourses mm -hmm. of sustainability mm -hmm. nowadays? Yes. Absolutely, yes. So uh, you're absolutely right. So um, hegemonic discourses. So this is this is the dominant um, the dominant discussions that we have and the way that we discuss certain topics throughout society um, and we often think that we're having lots of different conversations that we we, th we often think that we're free to talk about whatever it is we want to talk about and we often think that we have um, freedom of ideas but actually we are being controlled in ways that we don't know god this sounds crazy doesn't it <laughs> i am not actually a conspiracy theorist um, the importance of historical block is essentially that human society uh, has done things in the same way for a long time. And it's very difficult to get out of those habits. And we can talk about that on a global level, and we can talk about that on a country level. And on a country level, it's probably a little bit easier. So every country has its own traditions. And we do things in certain ways, not because we consciously decide to do them that way, but because we've always done them that way. This also happens in companies. And so historical block is all about the, the is, is what, what Gramsci, uh, the term Gramsci used to try and describe how difficult it is to change things on a, on a, wider scale, on a country scale or on a society scale. Because even though we might decide, okay, we need to change, we have to have some radical changes, even though we might have a revolution, and he was talking really about radical changes and bloody revolutions, he noticed that even after the revolution, the same people end up in power. And if you look around the world at countries where they've had revolutions, you can see this happening again and again and again. It happened in Romania, uh, for example. So there was this big revolution and the uh, president got hung and his wife got hung and then freedom was brought in and democracy was brought in. And then after a few weeks, they realized we don't have anybody who can run the economy. We don't know how to organize our institutions. And so bit by bit, they started coming back in again because those were the guys with the experience. The same thing happened in Indonesia. So you ended up with the people who had been overthrown by the revolution coming back in again in the new system, which was then called democratic. 
And so the same ideas then start being built back into the system. But actually, that makes the old ideas even stronger because we've been through the process of throwing out all the bad stuff and we've had our freedom of speech and we've had our legitimization of the new system. And so we have given our consent as a society for these people to continue as our leaders.